Hey, what's up? Thank you, Offer. So how's everybody doing today? It's kind of like almost lunchtime, right? Very soon. So uh, I won't take too much of your time, but thank you guys for being here. And thank you to uh, Angular Up for having me out here to Israel for the first time. It's been, uh, you know, an unimaginable pleasure to, to be here. So, And I didn't know how hospitable Israeli people are, so... Uh, I learned that, and that's been really cool. Something that we Americans sh could work on. Um, so yes, this talk is called Webpack for the State of the Art. Um, how many here know what Webpack is? There's some who don't, and that's okay. Um, it gives me a good context. Who uh, uses Webpack today or depends on it at, the, at their job every day? That's awesome. Who here knows how it works? That's okay. We have tooling to help you not have to worry about that. And we're, we're proud of that, right? We're more than just a build tool or a platform for development. We're a platform for frameworks to be able to um, allow you to have a seamless development experience. And that's what's important to us. Um, so why this talk? Why state of the art? Well, as you might know that just recently, there we go, now we got the clicker working. Um, so yeah, who am I, who am I? If I, oh, it's so many clicks. There we go, yeah, so for those who don't know, my name is Sean Larkin and I'm a program manager for Microsoft. I work on Microsoft Edge and their Edge Dev tools, but about 40 to 50% of the time, I also work with other, what we call internal partners, helping them use Webpack. Um, did you know that Webpack is the third most used open source project at Microsoft across their entire company? So uh, it was a, a joy to find this out after getting hired. I don't think they hired me because they rely on Webpack, but it's given me a really unique opportunity to provide value across the company. Um, but as you also may know, that I'm one of the maintainers of Webpack. Uh, I spent some time bringing Webpack to the Angular community by uh, being on their core team for the Angular CLI and uh, landing the first commit that brought Webpack there. Now mind you, there are many other people who work on that team now who are helping being stewards to take care of that, um, especially now that I'm maintaining Webpack. Um, but I'm also a huge evangelist for open source sustainability. Um, these projects every day, they are the modern roads and bridges, right? You use roads and bridges every day. Who pays for them? Technically, we all do, you know, tolls, taxes, etc. But Without them, you'd be able to get nowhere. So we make the same analogy with open source. Without Webpack or without any other of these tools, Babel, TypeScript, where would we be? And who pays for them? So open source sustainability is really huge to me. Um, and then I'm also a representative on the Node.js Foundation, working on the modules group, and then also as of recently on the W3C WebAssembly community group, helping to bring our perspective and users' needs for WebAssembly and the future of the specification. Um, and then, so like a little bit about myself, uh, I'm a former tech support rep gone rogue. I don't have any formal training, I'm a music graduate. Who studied music in college? Woo, yeah. It was parish music, technically. So I had to learn a year of Hebrew, but I totally forgot it. Um, and, but I, I also, you know, I got tired of not being able to help people uh, solve their problems. We were just working around them. Uh, you know, you sit every day on the phone and do tech support. And it got really frustrating, and so I taught myself how to program. I started with AppleScript. Uh, I continued with things like Ruby and Objective-C. And then finally, I found JavaScript and fell in love. And so, like, if you want to find me anywhere, whoa, I swear this clicker, uh, you can find me at the Lark Inn. So, like, I'm on GitHub, Medium, Code pen, Stack Overflow, at the Lark Inn. You can tweet at me uh, anytime you want. DMs are open. I try to respond to them as quick as possible. Uh, so yes, Webpack 4, the state of the art. What does this even mean? So like the state of the art, uh, I tried to find like what, what are we trying to define here? And really to sum it up, it's, we're just talking about what is the latest almost bleeding edge of what we're doing every day with Webpack? And why is it important to you? And so I think it was, let's see, 
I look at the date, February 25th. So February, March, April, May, June. So it's now been, Webpack 4 was finally released uh, about four months ago, four and a half technically. And um, we decided to name this uh, Webpack Legato. It was the first time we said, well, let's start uh, going ahead and giving each major breaking change or major version change a code name or you know, a name to it. And we called this Webpack Legato. So those music majors, again, you know, you kind of understand what Legato means, but let's define it. Uh, so Legato means to play notes in a smooth and flowing manner without gaps. Um, and this name was given to us by a company called Trivago. Who knows what Trivago is or have ever used their services? <clears throat> so we offered the opportunity for our project to be named by our largest sponsor. Did you know that Trivago has contributed over $110,000 to our project? So something to think about. Uh, so we reached out to them. We said, hey, Patrick Gotthardt, uh, who's the, uh, the original person behind the sponsorship, I said, can you name you know, this version of Webpack? And they said, okay. So they sent this message. They said, at Trivago, we usually give our projects a name or a musical theme. And so, for example, our old JavaScript framework was called Harmony, and our new one is called Melody. And on the PHP side, we use Symphony with a layer on top called Orchestra. And so we thought that legato, to us, means to play each note in sequence without gaps. And Webpack bundles our entire front end without gaps, the CSS, the JavaScript. And so we really believe that legato is a perfect fit. And we thought so too. Uh, we thought it was really special. And it's not just Trivago. I mean, you can see there, at the time it was 70,000 when I, when I took this slide. Um, but all of these companies here are responsible for helping ensure that we are still building today. And so, you know, if you represent one of these companies, if you work for one of these companies, or if you're one of our individual backers and sponsors, I couldn't even get all of them on the same slide. So there's like, I think, twice as many as what you see here. So, you know, why don't, I always like to give this opportunity, but why don't we give them a hand? Because without, without these people and these sponsorships, we would be nothing today. There would be no Webpack 4, I don't think, or 3. Um, and to take that a step further, in the month of March, we gave out $32,000 in rewards or um, expenses for contributions that were made to our, our open source projects. So what you may not know is that we have this platform called Open Collective where you saw all these sponsors and backers and half of this money goes towards giving back to the contributors who contribute on a consistent basis. Um, and we've had our largest contribution base in January with over 11 or 1,000 individual contributors. And it's been growing since. So let that set kind of the scene of where we are going and how much our ecosystem is growing. So what Webpack for? What, what is it about? We wanted to define three things that kind of really set the stage for what we were going to focus on and how we were going to implement it. And so the first one was smaller and faster builds. And then next was modernization. And then finally, developer experience. Uh, last but not least, developer experience. <laughs> so to attain smaller and faster builds, it's kind of it's kind of contradictory when you think about it. To have smaller builds or create smaller bundles, you're having to do more static analysis. And you're going to have to process more of the module graph. But on the other hand, for, for anything to be faster in programming, you can only do two things. You can do less work, or you have to reuse work that's already done. So you can already kind of see that this, is, this was going to be a challenge for us. So we decided to do some things, uh, you know, take care of the low-hanging fruit first. So we completely rewrote what we call the chunk graph. And we'll talk about more how we did this and kind of what were the, what were the breaking side effects to this. Um, but we rewrote the chunk graph completely. Um, and this allowed us to do a lot of things uh, the right way when it comes to creating bundles. A chunk in Webpack is just another word for the internal structure of a bundle that gets created. 
uh, we also decided to take and leverage the latest, uh, the latest updates that Uglify JS and Uglify ES uh, shipped. And so those come with being able to have parallelism and also caching out of the box. So if in Webpack 4, if you do a production build and then you build it again, you'll notice a significant drop in size uh, in terms of how long it takes to build. And then we decided to move a lot of our internal data structures, like objects and arrays, and convert them to the things that were more appropriate in JavaScript, like maps and sets. Who uses maps and sets day to day? If you don't, give it a try. Um, but then we kind of, we dug deeper. We dug deeper and we decided to completely rewrite our plugin system. You might say like, Sean, that's kind of a, that's kind of a big deal. If you understand how Webpack works under the hood, you'll know that everything in Webpack and our source code are plugins. We're a complete event-driven system that writes our own plugins, the same plugins that you use today in your configurations. But what we allowed, what this allowed us to do is leverage a technique um, called monomorphism. And so hooks are now monomorphic. Who knows what monomorphism or polymorphic means in JavaScript or just in programming? So I'll, I'll explain an example here. So this is a function from our plugin library. Uh, it's called tappable. So if you've ever heard of tappable or if you've ever seen a previous talk by me, uh, I talk about this a little bit uh, more in depth. But how this works is that Webpack has about six or seven classes that extend this library. And this library provides functions that allow you to emit events in a different variety of ways. And so you can think of it like event emitter with kind of a custom way to do parallelism, whether it's parallel or async or waterfall or sequential parallel. Um, there's a couple of varieties. But what's important here to notice is that uh, how this would work is that you would call this function and the first argument would be a string, which would be the event, just like event emitter. Um, however, what can happen is that you can pass any arbitrary data into the rest of the parameters. And so if you look at the implementation of this function, what this means is that we had to take any number of arguments uh, and then we would have to actually take and figure out exactly what the data types are or the amount of arguments that would be applied. Now the problem with this is that the JavaScript engines do not know how to optimize what we call polymorphic code. So in this case, we just have any number of args. It could be one, it could be six. Um, and so there are techniques that JavaScript engines do under the hood that would allow you to inline the results of these functions if they knew how many arguments there were. And so the kind of the intermediate step that we tried to take is that we said, well, there's a lot of functions inside of our code base that just call this function with like one arg or two arguments or three. And so why don't we just create these functions, right? And add it to the library. Um, however, this is really unmaintainable because there's about, you know, over, there's thousands and thousands of permutations and combinations of different arguments, different types, um, and these functions. And so it, it would be extremely brittle and hard to maintain and even harder to contribute. And so what we did is we took this technique, we call it lazy compiling. And so what we do is um, if we wanted to ensure that we had a unique function with a strict set of arguments per any combination of things hooking up into it, that we would compile it. And we say compile, but maybe if, if you could read this code, uh, you can see that this is a bunch of strings that we concatenate together and build a function out of it, just based on, you know, like a switch case. Um, and then at the bottom here, we call new function, and we pass those static arguments. But now, we've created this determinism, right? So now, for any given case and any given amount of arguments, we have one function. And that is the same function that's going to be used every time for that exact combination. And so this ensures what we call monomorphic we can guarantee that there's an exact amount of arguments for this certain case when it's called. You might, you might be like, Sean, this, this makes no sense. What is this monomorphism? So if you do have questions or you want to look it up, I have a link here. But there is a, uh, a really brilliant engineer called Vyacheslav Egorov who uh, wrote an entire blog series about this. Um, 
and he contributes to V8, and so it, it's super interesting why uh, he wrote this. But if you're on Twitter like all the time like I am, uh, you may have seen he also tweeted something um, <laughs> called, maybe you don't need Rust and WebAssembly to speed up your JavaScript. And so this was super interesting, and there's the link to the tweet. But um, <laughs> after reading the post, I was like, hmm, that looks familiar. And of course, Tobias, the original author of Webpack, was like, hey, we use that technique. Um, and so here's a, 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 an example right from, from the blog post that even shows, hmm, they compile based on templates and call new function. And so this is the exact same technique that we're referring to. Um, but as you can see here, as I call V8 Senpai, Benedict Moyer, the uh, engineering manager for uh, V8 on Node and JavaScript. Don't use this in your user lane code. Um, don't do this at home. This is really uh, unique and, and only necessary for projects that are literally, you know, calling the same function hundreds of thousands to millions of times over and over and over again and that need this optimization. So, Sean, was this crazy amount of abstraction worth it? Was it worth it? Um, like, we decided to just yield the numbers and, and see. So, our Webpack builds, after re-implementing this plugin system, got 97% faster. 97% faster. And that's not, like, this was just by replacing the plugin system and using this new monomorphism. I get goosebumps every time I say it. Like, it makes me so excited because I'm proud of the work that we've done. Um, and, <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so what's even cooler is that, um, like, at first when I saw that number, I was like, he's just over-exaggerating because he, he over-exaggerates all the time. Uh, you know, I thought people were gonna think that, and so, but no! This was actually case studies that we used to, to measure this. And so there, were, there was, actually we worked with Philippe Silva, who is a, a contributor. He's on the Angular CLI core team. And it was an Angular project that was running nine hours to build. Nine hours to do a single build. Um, and you know, you see six hours here, but they had to stop it half, you know, like part way, because it was taking too long. Um, and the results, 17 minutes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, this was really exciting for us, um, and this was just the beginning. We were just scratching the surface. Um, and so, like, I was like, okay, well, that's a really large-scale Angular project. People are not going to believe me if I start throwing 98% everywhere. Um, and so I decided to use this technique called get people to, to test out your product by, you know, bribing them to be in a Medium publication. And so <laughs> I sent out this tweet, I said, hey, please, could you test before and afters of Webpack builds across any framework, across any library, whatever. And so we were literally seeing still 75% build time reductions, 80%. And you can even see there in this example, this was a production build without any changes going down from 26 seconds to nine, just with that parallelism and caching for Uglify. Exact same code that was generated. Yep. Um, now, well, that's a good question. Is it generating the same code? And that leads me to the next, you know, part of this with smaller builds, right? So it's going to be generating less code because we added a bunch of features to give you the ability to ship smaller bundles, right? And so one of the first ones that we did was called JSON tree shaking. Um, we decided JSON is really just a stricter set of JavaScript, right? Um, and so we could have the ability, because it's pretty static in nature, to treat it just like an ES6 module, or I'm sorry, an ESM module. And so we decided to give people the ability to actually, when you import one property from a JSON file, just as if it was an ES module, let's say it has two properties, you'll notice that only one gets pulled into the build in production mode. So this gives you the opportunity to shed any of the unused JSON that's in your code. And then probably one of the most important features that we shipped uh, for smaller builds is called uh, the side effects flag. Um, and so who here is like huge into functional programming? Okay, 
It's not the same kind of side effects that you, you know there or in Haskell or things like that. Um, so let's give this example. So we have a library, you know, that exports, you know, from three separate files, right? Um, and then you're importing it in your user lane code and you're going to use it. Now in Webpack 3, we had to align to the ES module specification, which says you must evaluate and execute every export, even if it is not used. And the reason is because one of these exports could affect, you know, another one and cause it to be dependent and needed in your bundles or needed in the code that's being evaluated. So if you look here, you know, you can see that by default, we had to include every single export in the code. Um, and so what we said was, well, how can we tell Webpack that, you know, this isn't causing a side effect, but, um, you know, it is being used correctly as an ES module. And so we added this flag called side effects. Um, in a package.json file, as a library author, you can add this field and set side effects false. And what Webpack will do, it's just giving it a compiler hint that says, skip the exports that aren't used, right? only look at what's explicitly being pulled into your code. And so this was a way for us to not only do less work, but also signal for us to an analyze only what's needed and analyze more. Probably one of the most like trademark examples that I love to give is that uh, John, John, Dal John David Dalton, or JD, uh, you know him as the author of Lodash, right? Uh, he's a coworker of mine, and so I, like, I kind of convinced him. I was like, hey, before you release Webpack 4, can we ship side effects false in your project, right? It's not going to cause a breaking change for anybody, um, but we know that there are no side effects caused against exports in, in your code. And so he said, okay, fine, sounds good. Um, now, at the time when we tweeted this, it was called Pure Module, but we renamed it to Side Effects. Um, but you can see here that, you know, this is Webpack 3, um, and you can see we have kind of this graph here, like pure module is the side effects flag. But, um, and, and so you can see we started out with 223. If you just used one import from Lodash in Webpack 3, it costs you 223 kilobytes, and that's minimized. But then, using Webpack 4, without changing the code whatsoever, and just taking the side effects module, or the side effects uh, flag inside the package, the exact same code base compiled down was now three kilobytes. So when, you th <laughs> so when you think about this in perspective, like there are other libraries which tend to do this, this kind of pattern where they re-export a bunch of things into a top package, like Angular. Um, and so this is gonna yield significant, significant size wins for those who are using uh, Angular with Webpack 4. So now, you know, like, when you put it all into perspective, all you have to do is tree shake and mangle your exports and scope hoist and minimize, and then package authors have to set side effects, right? Wrong! That's ridiculous! You shouldn't have to do any of that. And that kind of leads me into the next thing, which is developer experience. The only thing you should have to do is run Webpack, right? And so we set out, by default, we added a new feature called mode, and we said, well, how can we have all of these things turned on using a really small heuristic? And so we created the mode property, which just says as a developer using Webpack or maybe a framework, it doesn't matter. You just need to define whether you're in a production or a development environment. And so now out of the box with Webpack 4, we set the mode to production. You can override it. But you can see here, I, I try to show this example, is that we're not only scope hoisting, but we're tree shaking, we're identifying which exports aren't used, and most importantly, like look at the sidebar of that code, what's not there? There's no webpack config. This is out of the box by default. We decided to default three properties in webpack and just said, well, if we just tell people to use the convention to put your, your entry point in source slash index, we don't need a config. That was the only thing needed. So now by default with Webpack 4, you don't need a configuration. At least to get started. <laughs> Thank you. And this was like, developer experience to us means lowering the barrier to entry, right? 
It's just being more approachable of a library. Like, I remember the, what, it was only three hands that came up when it said, how many understand how Webpack works? And, I mean, in the long run, do you really need to to get started or to play around with it or enjoy using modules out of the box? No, you shouldn't. Um, and it was better defaults. And then most importantly, this, this term that we kind of stole from Parcel called zero CJS. Um, but we like to set ourselves really far apart from libraries that claim that they are zero config. Because zero config doesn't mean that you get to just have any integration out of the box and shoving it into one package and you never have to touch a config file. We think that's wrong. And we've seen the side effects of that. There are a lot of issues with trying to have all these things integrated into one package. Especially if it causes a breaking change for a feature you don't use. So to us, zero config means being able to extend and extending that idea to the ecosystem so that you can define it. So that means out of the box, we want to, we see a future in the work that we've done here that lets you define what zero config means to you, to your project, to your company to your framework's users. And so like I said, mode. This kind of enabled and was really the platform for enabling all of these awesome features. You have production, which we turn on by default. Like at first people are like, why do you want to do that, Sean? And I think at the end of the day, we're, we want to be, like Webpack has two purposes. One is what, it, what a bundler does, right? It allows you to use modules that work in the browser in the fastest way possible. But then also, it's a performance tool. It's supposed to be there to enable you to be able to ship fast applications in JavaScript. And so we said, let's, let's do production by default. But we also have a development mode. It's meant so that you can have tooling for the browser. It's meant to have extremely fast incremental builds and super useful error messages at runtime and even decorated in the code itself. And then also production, which does scope hoisting and concatenation and tiny output size. It doesn't expose the source code to, you know, your, or file paths in your bundles. And it's easy to use output paths. And then oh, Angular people, do you recognize this tombstone? We are getting rid of scope. No. <laughs> Even better. In Webpack 4, we got rid of the commons chunk plugin. Um, we saw so often that people were trying to manipulate and tweak and like almost frothing at the mouth, like obsessive about this plugin. Like, Sean, how can I get these three modules into this one file and ship it and do it dynamically? And it, it, so we got rid of this plugin because we think that cacheability is probably one of the least important web performance features. Um, I think there's a parable that says, why are you worrying about the, the speck in one eye when you have a plank in the other, right? And you know, the problem is that the plank really is how much JavaScript you're shipping down, down the, the wire. And so we got rid of this so that people wouldn't think that they're actually shipping you know, a really fast vendor bundle because it's still five megabytes. Um, now, mind you, we still have capabilities in Webpack that allow you to do similar things, but we fix a lot of issues that were perf gun or like foot, foot gun related. Um, and then one of my favorite, since I'm running out of time, one of my favorite features that we added to Webpack, you know, from a developer contributor standpoint, um, I worked with Sam Sacconi from Google, uh, who's he's kind of like the harbor master. He works on tooling all day and analytics for tooling uh, at Google and their build systems. And we, we created this integration that allows you to do a profile of Webpack and then understand exactly which plugins are taking the longest. And so this is a plugin out of the box in Webpack. You can just do uh, the, it's like webpack.debug.profile plugin. And so this gives you the capability to understand which plugins are causing the most time. So if you see build-related problems, now it's really easy to identify what they are and even send it to us as a trace. Um, and then finally, the, the, the module type architecture. So now we've been able to add JSON as a module type and it takes us even further. 
we're going to add other assets as a module type to be able to have them as first class citizens out of the box. So this means you could maybe have an HTML entry point. This could also mean that you can use things like, <laughs> you could use things like Walt, which looks like TypeScript, but actually compiles to WebAssembly under the hood. And it also allowed us to do things like drop Node v4 support. So now we can ship WASM in our own code for those who are using Node v8 and running uh, Webpack. And we're even working on that right now through Google Summer of Code. And I mean, this is just scratching the surface. So like, there is a huge amount of changes that, are going to, that have been made. Um, and I encourage you that even if like, you're using Angular at work today, just go ahead and download Webpack and spin up a project just with ES modules, right? Interact with the DOM, do whatever. Um, and experience what it feels like you know, to get started with something that's zero config or to really understand the power of what Webpack is providing. And at the end of the day, it was these three things. It's smaller and faster builds, and modernization, and, and most importantly, the developer experience. So, you know, of course, like I'm running out of time, so I'll just slip to one of my last slides and just say, go ahead and build, you know, try it today. Take what, well, I have more slides, but. <laughs> uh, try Webpack, you know, out of the box. Use our CLI and see how it is. And of course, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me on Twitter or whatever. Come find me afterwards, but thank you guys.